Hello and welcome back. And that's right, today I want to answer a very simple question. Why isn't 25 gig Ethernet and 40 gig Ethernet not a thing when it comes to SMB and enthusiasts, the lower tiers and rungs of the ladder of service? 10 GPE is pretty much dominating all over the shop on 1 gigabit Ethernet and even 2.5 and 5G have been around a while. When it comes to 25 gig and 40 gig, despite these network bandwidth tiers being around for as long as they have, they are by no means commonplace. They are high-end enterprise, they are data center, they are pie in the sky. So, in this video, I'm gonna walk you through the five reasons why 25 gig and indeed 40 gig networks are just not commonplace, regardless of the fact that that technology has been around a while. So, without further ado, let's crack on with the obvious one. Let's go with number one, price. Look, I know this table looks dead messy. That's kind of my whole shtick. But when it comes to the price parity between 10 GBE and 25 GBE and 40 GBE, there is not parity. 25 GBE is not two and a half times the price of 10 GBE, and 40 GBE isn't four times the price of 10 GBE. It just isn't. 10 GB has become significantly more affordable with so many devices in the market from the recently discussed here on the channel. USB 4 to 10 GB adapter, Thunderbolt to 10 GB adapters there. We've got smaller 10, uh, 10 GB switches that take advantage of SFP technology there. We have got 10 GB cards rocking out the gate cheaper and cheaper. Dual port 10 GB cards coming out the gate cheaper and cheaper. One port, two port, four port. 10 GBE is huge all over the place in terms of pricing and availability. And to break that down into price parity, if we look at the pricing of 10 GBE right now, now you can keep it dead affordable, but a single port 10 G card, depending on what you want to spend, you can get 10 G cards for as little as 40 quid. You can get single port cards very affordably on the likes of AliExpress and eBay. These cards are knocking around for approximately 30 to 40 pounds and dual port cards, X server grade, you know, Intel X54s, these dual port cards you pick up for about 60, uh, 60, 70 quid. Now, if you spend a bit more, you wanna go dedicated branded, then you're looking at about, for the one port, about 80 quid and maybe up to 160 or 200 for a two port card. Now. Depending on whether you're going to go copper, which is utilizing the same Ethernet cabling you've always used, or you go for SFP cabling with or without transceivers, then things can get expensive at 10GBE. You either have to buy separate transceivers that go inside the ports and connections of a fiber based connection, and these allow you to use longer distance cables. Those little transceivers will cost you 15 to 30 nicker. The cables will cost you about 8 quid a meter. 10 GBE switches, whether you go managed, whether you go semi-mixed, which is a switch that will have 10 GBE and 2.5 GBE and even 1 GBE there, or you go up to full managed layer 2 or layer 3 for lots of sub-networks, you're looking at a price point there, starting at around the 100 quid mark, going up to about 4, 450. So that means that for a modest setup of, say, uh, two PCs and a NAS and a switch, you can get a 10 GBE setup for approximately seven to 750 nicker to keep things really modest. And you can even bring that down further with copper networks and using easy USB adapters and Thunderbolt adapters. You can actually bring it down for a two PC, one NAS, one switch setup there, one of those PCs, maybe a laptop, to about 600 nicker as an upgrade, particularly if you're gonna reuse some of those cables we mentioned earlier on and avoid SFP. Now, if we switch over, to the 25 gig and 40 gig side of things. Again, it isn't two and a half and four times that price point. For, two point, uh, for 25 gig of ethernet, a one and two port card, for example, is gonna set you back between 200 and 450 quid. So already, one of these two port cards is closely matching the price of the entire 10 GBE system. Remember, Later on, we're going to be pricing up two PCs, one NAS, one switch. Now, when it comes to the switch, a 25 gig switch, you're looking at about a grand. Even the half semi sorted out switches that have got a lot of 10 Gs and one or two 2.5 gigs, which are quite rare, by the way, or 40 gig switches, add another zero there. Um, when it comes to 25 gig dedicated switches, where if you wanted at least six to eight ports, so two each for each of those connected PCs, two for the NAS, and you're gonna need your WAN as well. The result there is you're looking about a grand entry point for that switch. Now for cabling, 
forget copper. There is no copper, realistically, in 2. Uh, 25 gig and 40 gig. You are immediately going either towards ready-made cables that have got transceivers connected, or you're going to have to buy yourself ready-made 25 gig transceivers and even 40 gig transceivers. The result is that these are going to cost you approximately 15 to 20 quid a meter of cable and individual transceivers start at around 50 quid and go up even higher as you go into the higher quality transceivers that have got better saturation as well as cables uh, and transceivers that are designed for higher dense distance use. The result is that even a modest 25 gigabit ethernet network again two pcs one nas one switch and if you were going to have this at an incredibly small distance by the way which later in this video you'll understand why that's a problem you're going to have to spend minimum about three grand without the tax and even if you don't want it to be terrible and you need you know maybe someone in a different room you're looking closer to five grand entry points and it's just not comparable now i will say that the difference in price point between 25 gig and 40 gig, which again has been around a while, 40 gig and 25 gig, the price is actually relatively close. And that's why a lot of users actually go ahead and skip a lot of the 40 gig these days and go straight to the 100 gig switches that are starting to roll out affordably. Massive italic marks on that. But the point I'm making is one of the main reasons 25 gig and 40 gig have not become as ubiquitous as 10 GBE, despite the large amount of performance bandwidth, it's simply that price point there. It is just simply too high. Bandwidth democracy. It's a wanky term, but basically I'm just talking about just how much bandwidth the host client system is going to need to afford to a 25 gig or 40 gig network environment there. Now, when it comes to 25 GBE cards, and again, the majority of them, by the way, when at least when it comes to the price point, you generally kind of highly advise to go straight into a dual port card when it comes to either 25 gig or even some of those legacy uh, Mellanux uh, 4 gig, 40 gig cards. Because of the price difference between a 1 and a 2 port, and the fact that most of these cards arrive in times 8 or times 16 speed, people always tend to go for the 2 port cards regardless there, because it's just a waste of good bandwidth if you don't. And with these being times 8 or times 16, that means on a Gen 3 slot, you're looking at uh, 8,000 to 16,000 megabytes per second there. Again, not exact max, we're just going with lanes times speed, but... That's a huge amount of bandwidth there. So why is bandwidth democratization such a problem? Well, a lot of NAS systems, they are really eking the bandwidth in the available lanes in the amount of speed very thinly across their system. And a lot of modest systems will not arrive with greater than a times eight slot. And in some cases, just a times four slot with a cutout that allows you to use a larger card. That is gonna heavily restrict the utilization of larger bandwidth external cards like this one. Moreover, a lot of P, um, CPUs, and we're not gonna go delve too deep into um, CPU PCI slot versus chipset slot, but what I will say is a lot of CPUs, if you start running a large dense card like these, they're just not gonna play nice. They can't separate the data and handle that data passing through it, and more of that in a moment, in a way that is going to be beneficial to actually justify the investment on these cards. So in some cases, it's a physical limitation on more modest NAS systems that just utilizing one of these cards is not a viable option. But when it comes to the democratization and the utilization of that bandwidth, what you'll often find is there just isn't enough um, oil in the tank to keep this moving to spread that bandwidth out. And this is doubly so when you're seeing systems that are rocking out the gate with highly powerful AMD processors inside that have got a huge amount of throughput to push through, but they're still at 16 to 20 to 24 lanes separated across the system. And they would rather give you lots of PCIe slots or give you lots of storage slots, something we'll talk about later on. And more often than not, when it comes to the larger mid-tier systems, particularly those that are trying to take advantage of AI, those that are going to be using GPU cards, which always like to live in that time 16 high performance slot. So that means cards like this, again, coming back to that PCIe bandwidth uh, democratization, will have to be utilized in the lower slot. Once again, lessening that throughput um, internally within the system. And just because you put a time 16 or times eight card in a lower slot, which may afford 4,000 megabytes per second on a times four speed, or even a gen four times four slot that apparently can give a uh, gen five times four slot that could give you a potential 16, 
the way these cards are laid out and utilizing each available um, time speed of that slot, the result is going to be that you're still going to be capping the total performance of this card if you use it in an inappropriate slot. Ultimately, a lot of users have not adopted 25 gig and 40 gig or more modest storage setups, regardless of the storage media and power they have, simply down to physical availability of the slots and the afforded lanes on those slots. Modest CPUs that may afford all of the lanes that you need to take advantage of 25 gig and 40 gig, they're going to give you the lanes, but they're not going to give you the performance and the throughput there. CPUs that are arriving with mid-tier systems, I'm not talking about Celerons. I mean, if you're looking at 25 gig with a Celeron system, you're mad anyway. But even when you look at some of the embedded Ryzen architecture, even when you look at some of the, the Ryzen 3s, the Ryzen 7s, or even the Pentiums and Intel Core i3s, some of these just aren't giving the sustained um, support of external connections like dual port 25 gig and 40 gig, even with um, resource assisted, uh, resource uh, diluting uh, performance measures like SMB multi-channel, which really takes the overhead off the CPU to manage all of that, it's still not there. Now you can get higher performance cards, 25 gig, 40 gig, 100 gig, that have got onboard comprehensive controllers to ease some of the burden off the CPU. The problem is, once again, then we are tippetoeing into that enterprise sector there. And it still requires impressive CPUs to really make the most of those cards. CPU overhead and the CPU and hardware architecture of most mid-tier NAS systems are just simply not good enough to maintain sustained performance on cards like these. And that's another reason why 25 gig, 40 gig, and even 100 gig has just not become an industry standard yet. But the real reason is the next point. Now let's say you've been online, you've gone on eBay, you've picked up a second-hand snap server or something, and it's got 12 bays of storage on there, it's got a bevy of PCIe slots, it's got a decent little Xeon CPU inside there, and it's even included with a couple of 25 gig cards. You are laughing, you've made yourself a bargain, you're wondering, oh my god, what could go wrong? we got to talk about the storage media. Because realistically, you do not go for a huge amount of external performance with cars like this unless you are looking to move some serious amounts of data. Now, there may some of, be some of you that are using that for small data moving very, very quickly, low latency, but the majority of users are looking to move large amounts of data very quickly. And this is where the setback problem lies. Let's say you want to go for serious storage. This is a 24 TB Seagate iron wall drive. It knocks around for about five to 600 nicker, and that's 24 TB, right? You're going to have to get two of those, at least so you've got your RAID, and then you're going to have to think about your backups as well. So if you've got three of those drives, so one backup and one drive inside for redundancy with one of those drives in external, you're already looking at about, mm, about 15 to 1800 nicker at that point you've spent. But the problem is, drives like that give you about 200 to 260 megabytes per second, even in a RAID 1 environment there, you're looking at no more than about three to 400 megs on a good day. This card here can give us, this is a 25 gig times two card, this will allow us somewhere in the region of 5,000 megabytes per second. My point is, the storage media is just not going to fully saturate that external connection. So you're going to start looking at SATA SSDs to populate this second-hand snap server you bought. The problem there lies, even if you go for cheap SSDs that are used in second-hand, which we don't recommend, you're still looking at SATA connections there of performance numbers. If you are lucky on that 12 bay with maybe two disks and array disk redundancy array, so you've got 10 drives of storage, if you're lucky you're going to be crossing into two, maybe 2,003, 2,400 megs. You might be able to saturate one of these 25 gig connections. So at that point, you have to move on to M2 NVMe storage. And this is where the prices start to go up. And I know this feels like I'm overlapping onto the price point from earlier, but I'm not. Because once you're using all of those drives, you're still prone to oversaturation, even when you spread the performance over multiple drives and that's notwithstanding if you start moving into SAS based SSD storage but on top of that with that oversaturation of the drives the oversaturation of those drives can also lead to inconsistencies in that data yes you can roll in with ECC run a BTRFS or something as your file system all of the checksums are built into ZFS as well all of that stuff but the point still remains that this is still not going to be a great system for that huge amount of storage outputting via those external ports. You'd have to go towards industrial class drives with high durability and sustained performance numbers there, which drives up the price, sure, but also means that 
you are going to need to go for elite level hardware just for the multimedia. Lots of users online have already discovered that when they are trying to move into higher external bandwidth, that suddenly to spend extra on the back end, like we mentioned earlier on with three to 5K for even a mid low tier 25 or 40 gig setup, they then have to spend an absolute fortune on the storage media. Zoom consultation, Donald Witter, hello again. Um, we were doing a back and forth. We were talking about um, setting up a great video editing workstation, moving up to 6 and 8K for high bandwidth, and then it just turned into, to saturate that external high bandwidth, you then have to double down on the internal bandwidth. So one of the big reasons for a lot of users not embracing 25 gig and 40 gig at that mid and even slightly higher tier there has simply been that suddenly the, it's cost of the internal storage media just to make advantage, to take advantage of the external capacity for bandwidth is just not workable, both on a financial stance and a scale stance. Everyone seems to overlook noise and heat when it comes to 25 gig and 40 gig. Now, there's going to be heat in pretty much any technology from small micro mini PCs like this all the way down to tiny PCIe cards like this one. Indeed, this two port uh, card here has got a heat sink, no active fan on there. That heat's got to go somewhere, right? Now, if we look at 10 GBE, I've got myself a 10 GBE switch. This isn't that modern. This is a, a Netgear. Um, 8 port 10G switch here, it's managed, it's an L3 grade, and if we go ahead and plug this in, we'll put that switch there by the mic, you hear that noise? That is what a business tier 10G managed switch sounds like. You can get switches that are unmanaged, you can get switches that are fanless, but ultimately, once you've got this many switches, pummeling data back and forth, especially when you're dealing with 10 GBE over SFP fiber with transceivers, that's a lot of heat. And that's even at just the 10 GBE level. Now, when you move into 25 gig and 40 gig, that is when a lot of this hardware is gonna go bananas in terms of noise. Most of those cards in the modern era have got onboard fans with them, and the switches, my God, the switches, they're basically rack mount devices that have either been compressed into a desktop um, 25 gig or 40 gig or 100 gig switch, or they are switches that already take up most of the desk in terms of depth just for that high um, horizontal cooling systems in place there. But we haven't even talked, again, about storage media and heat, because we've already agreed that if we want performance to saturate, we're never gonna get it with hard drives. And that is where M2 NVMEs come in. And to saturate 25 gig, 40 gig, and 40, uh, 100 gig external bandwidth, we need storage media that could hit that too. And most of that storage media gets real hot. Great example, this is a Gen 5 drive, the next storage NEM1, I believe. And this drive here, their newer generation one, achieves 14 gigabytes per second read over 12 gigabytes per second write. 14,000 over 12,000 but it can only achieve that speed, even under uh, synthetic testing, for approximately a minute, minute and a half. And that's because the cache gets oversaturated and also the drive will get too hot and eventually bottleneck itself periodically so it can cool down. So you have to have huge active cooling systems running through just to keep the storage media warm. The point I'm making is, notwithstanding the power consumption, the amount of heat generated and therefore noisy cooling systems required on a larger 25 gig and 40 gig system, way beyond just the cards and the switches, result in an incredibly noisy environment. Something that you only really find at data center level because they've got the physical space to contain the server arrays that are gonna generate all that noise. And just simply at the mid tier level, we don't have the space or the sheer will to put up with that amount of noise in close proximity there. And once you include more systems, include more NAS systems, include more video editing stations, the noise just keeps getting higher, the power consumption gets higher, and the irritation skyrockets. And ultimately, that for me is one of the biggest reasons what the 25 gig has not broken in to the popular sector in the same way 40 gig Thunderbolt has, because it has achieved the ability to give that bandwidth, but with lower noise. Again, we could bang on about multiple hard drives and the noise they create, but I think the rest of this noise we've covered really does a better job of that. But this has been why 25 gig and 40 gig and indeed 100 gig is just not a thing outside of the data center. Maybe you disagree, let me know in the comments. But thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this. There should be a link in the description to a detailed article on this. I hope you enjoy it. And apart from that, have yourself a fantastic week.